something surprising is happening in Syria. From the chaos of war, an oasis of democracy has emerged, where women enjoy equal rights and all religions are tolerated. It's bringing stability to an area once dominated by ISIS. Amid the hustle and bustle of the commissioning markets, you could easily forget that conflict still stings this part of the world. Almost. It's a fragile system led by the Syrian Kurds. But it's under siege from ISIS in the south, the Syrian Assad regime to the west, and Turkey to the north. And now they've lost their trump card. The Americans are withdrawing troops, a vital support that's let the burgeoning democracy take hold. The young people here are betting on a brighter future. In a local hangout in the town of Kobani, I meet a young couple in love, Bircham and Azad. Azad Ahmad is a 26-year-old YPG fighter, part of the Kurdish military force that operates in this region. He helped liberate Kobani from ISIS four years ago. Bircham Abdel Al Qadr is a 19-year-old journalist. Bircham and Azad have been together for more than two years, and in typical fashion for a young soldier and journalist, their first meeting was infused with the politics of the region. The couple are about to get married. But this union almost didn't happen, with the threat of war always on the horizon. ما اینی نه هم تو دیم روش ساکیم بود یعنی من که من نزدیم بلکه چیزی که دیتریج در که هم چی بکنیم روش ارت در که
What's extraordinary is their union will be a civil rather than a religious one. It's a rare thing in a country where Islamic law has prevailed. Earlier in the day, Bocham and Azad stopped at their local council to make things official. While they can avoid the strictures of religious marriage, they can't escape the endless paperwork. Civil marriage is one of the new laws mandated by the little-known government structure holding together this area. The Kurdish-led authority controls about a quarter of the country and is seeking autonomy within a federated Syria. I'm going to the administrative headquarters in the town of Ainissa. It may seem unremarkable, but here we're seeing Northeast Syria's radical experiment in direct democracy. There's no top-down structure. Crucially, each position has to be taken by a male and a female, effectively mandating that 50% of positions in government are taken by women. Among the councillors is a 30-year-old civil engineer. Her name is Leila Mustafa. She's now the new head of Raqqa, the once notorious capital of ISIS, and the tasks ahead of her are formidable. Born and raised in Raqqa, Leila Mustafa is fiercely proud of her hometown, which was liberated from ISIS in 2017. Leila is keen to show me how her city is recovering. She takes me to Naim Square, the site of ISIS's most grisly punishments. Crucified and decapitated bodies were often put on display here. Layla is now leading the reconstruction of Raqqa and putting her engineering skills to good use. One of the biggest jobs is rebuilding the main bridge. A woman taking this role was unthinkable during ISIS rule. Even shaking hands with male colleagues was forbidden.
slowly, women are coming out of the shadows in Raqqa. Under ISIS, they were confined to the house and only seen in public in full covering with a male guardian. Back at council headquarters, we meet some women looking for work. While the ISIS caliphate has been pushed out of Raqqa, the group still holds a small pocket of territory further south. I'm heading to where the Kurdish majority Syrian Democratic Forces are waging their final battle against the group, with help from a US-led coalition. So we're on our way to the front line of what's left of ISIS's self-proclaimed caliphate. It once spanned a vast area the size of Britain and Syria and Iraq, and we're following a convoy of coalition soldiers. The battle against ISIS has been isolated to the southeastern Deir Ezzor region's village of Beruz. Coalition airstrikes caused much of the destruction here to drive ISIS out. But ISIS left behind hidden dangers. <laughs> Aram Kamishlu from the YPG, Syria's Kurdish military force, takes us through devastated villages toward the front line. Okay, so how far away is the ISIS position? From here to ISIS position, like 500 meters. Just 500 meters. Should we be out in the open like this? Aram decides it'll be safer to show me the front line from higher ground. It's just motorcycles going past. As now, the Binim, the Arami Dajida, Gala Kess, the motorcycle, the Angi Sahara, Harakatkin, Wahaman Dami, Bishana Kronio, Madrasa, the Shubin Jena, Zaruka, the Piosa Harakatkin, Wahaman Dami, and a Kiwaki, Sad Motor Harakatkin, the Arab Stone, the Slahaya, El Chetana. I mean, it's pretty extraordinary. These guys have to just sit and wait while they can see ISIS walking around just 500 meters away and they can't do anything about it because they don't want to hurt any of the civilians that are there. Aram wants to show me some of the underground tactics ISIS is using to fight. So Aram is about to take us to an ISIS tunnel. It's what they've been using to avoid the coalition airstrikes, and also it's it's how they've been able to move around freely. Because of booby traps? Yes. And mines? Yes, exactly. At the entrance of the ISIS tunnel, Aram tells me it hasn't been secured. Where, where does it lead? ISIS uses tunnels like this one to get behind SDF positions and ambush them with a suicide bombing. Perhaps we should move? Yeah, yeah. I mean, okay. actually, we had like those incidents. Of people popping out yeah. and attacking? Yeah. Let's do something. Yeah. The campaign against ISIS will soon be over. 
Most of the civilians have left Beirut, and the final assault is underway. But winning back territory has come at a heavy price. This village is where some of the ISIS leadership fled to after Raqqa fell. There's not much left of the town of Hajin. It's an absolutely apocalyptic scene. It took the SDF more than four months to take this town from ISIS, essentially destroying it in order to free it. Civilians are beginning to return to this Arab majority area, but many have nothing to come back to. And their anger is directed at the Kurds and their US backers. <laughs> I want to ask this man how he feels coming back to this. As ISIS territory is squeezed, the fighters and their families are being captured or have surrendered. One of the more pressing concerns for authorities here is what to do with captured ISIS fighters. About 900 foreign fighters are being held in Kurdish-run prisons all across the region. The US has called for countries to take back their citizens and prosecute them at home, but many nations just don't want them. The majority of captured ISIS members remain in limbo. They're being held in secret US-funded prisons. At a location we can't disclose, we meet with one. Alexander Ruzmatovich Bekmurzaev is an Irish national originally from Belarus. He wants to return to Ireland, but thinks it's unlikely he'll be brought back. He claims he and his family surrendered to the SDF as he escaped from ISIS last December. The SDF says that you were captured as you were trying to carry out an attack on civilians. Let's say, just for a second, uh, imagine yourself in my situation. Your husband is me. You're the wife like my wife, and you have a child. You planning to go surrender yourself, right? And uh, would you do any attack? Bekmer Zayev says he entered Syria in 2013, but insists he never fought, and offers this bizarre reason why ISIS never forced him to. OK, do you believe in magic? Try me. Okay. First of all, uh, Allah Azawajal, he said in Quran that he created uh, jinn and humankind. Okay. There is another creature. And this another creature, he been used by the people, magician. They can insert this creature inside of human being. And this is human being can uh, misbehave himself in a certain ways. It depends on the spell. Okay, for example, so you believe you're possessed? Yeah. It's difficult to ascertain his mental state or whether he was a fighter, but he paints a dire picture of the last days under ISIS. Towards the end, they just, they push people to fight, you know? They reduced uh, supply of the food. So they only bring the food for themselves, Iraqis. And then uh, what they do, you know, they just make an announcement, you know, if you're not gonna fight, you're, gonna, you're not gonna eat. And that's what happened to the most people, they don't eat. They were starving. Some, there was even uh, people died from the starvation, kids. What was morale like among people? They were still saying the victory is close, the victory is close. The victory from the Muslim people, it's always close. It's never far away. 
the administration says people like Bekmirzaev shouldn't be its problem. Foreign Minister Abdul Karim Omar is warning they could again become a threat. Any or any or any Turkey or any from other countries on this area is a chance for Daesh to escape from the prison. وبالتالي سيشكلون من جديد خطر علينا وعلى المجتمع الدولي وعلى مجتمعاتهم الأصلية ISIS has lost its caliphate but it's not defeated Taking back territory from ISIS doesn't mean the threat is over the group is going back to its guerrilla warfare roots. It has sleeper cells all over the region, conducting suicide bombings, ambushes on highways, and attacking checkpoints like this one. These tactics have already killed dozens. And Raqqa's new leader, Leila Mustafa, knows her life is in danger. <laughs> This young democracy may soon face a far bigger threat than ISIS. It will lose protection when US forces are pulled out as planned. Turkey has pledged to invade northern Syria and smash the Kurds. It fears autonomy here will embolden the 15 million Kurds inside Turkey to rise up with similar demands. Back at the front line, Commander Simko says they're ready for any Turkish offensive. أكيد كي شر ما بيك وكي بيجي والله يعني كي بخاص بي تعدل الملات ما بيك وال التشتي قم ما خلاص كريو أم ال المستقبل كي خش يعني ما داي برجع بخاي كي بخراب كم شر يبيك يعني كي بيعني. وهجرت يعني بيجي والله قوادي تحالف خو بيكشي نجفيتي كده شتان هنيج داعش بيستره هني هو تعب خبر ضان فيتي كده ساي تخازن شاري ما بكن يعني هي والله فيها من بندرة وشيء بنحطه ويشغل كنجي تركي إيريش كرن ويشغل جوي برسبك هاب جوي جوي إيريش شاري يعني Ismail Ibrahim gave his life to the cause. The 21-year-old YPG fighter was killed on the front line. It was an ISIS mine that he stepped on, but the rhetoric here is all about Turkey. <laughs> Here are worried more sons and daughters will be taken in a conflict with Turkey. Facing the withdrawal of US troops, 
Apart from a small peacekeeping force, the Kurds are keeping all options open, even negotiating with Russia and the Assad regime. Back in Kobani, the couple we met earlier, Azad and Burcham, are ready for their wedding party. It's time to celebrate new beginnings, but the conflict is never far away. Friends from the military and from all over the region descend on this very Kurdish affair. War may come, but for now, they're taking control of what they can. Kurdon, Rengi Kurdon, Jiona Kurdon, Hatish Kurdini, 